second video, we'll take a look at the frontier technologies that we described in the fourth Industrial Revolution video. We selected 10 of them for you, which we believe are going to have the most impact both on our broader environment and across sector, but in particular for the biopharmaceutical industry. Drones, blockchain technology, big data and analytics, augmented reality, 3D printing, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, robotics, Internet of Things, and genetics. So let's start with Internet of Things. Internet of Things is quite a simple concept, in fact. It is nothing more than software, electronics, sensors, actuators, which are located pretty much around us and are connected through Internet together. So we can have a broader understanding through a network perspective of what we are collecting from the environment and how we are interacting with our environment. This is truly a revolution and you live with it every day with your connected watch, your connected scale, your connected car, your connected phone. And historically they've been utilized in isolation. Now we can start connecting them together. We can cross match information and it's leading what we call big data. Big data is the amount of data that we gather and produce through those software sensors and other Internet of Things elements. We currently live in a 50 billion sensor economy, but it is predicted by McKinsey that by 2025 and 2030, we'll live in a, let's say, a 10 to 15 trillion sensor economy, which is going to mean that sensors and actuators are going to be pretty much everywhere around us, digitalizing the economy and our lives but also getting us the ability to source more data than we've ever been able to do. And for that, we need more computational power and more artificial intelligence to be able to analyze those data so that we can gather real insight on what's happening around us in order to make the world that we live in a better world. 3D printing is a fascinating technology. We're all used to the traditional 2D printing on a, on a printer. It starts with a computer model or models, and you can imagine having different 3D representation, which are virtual representation of objects. And your ability to send this virtual or digital object to a printer called a 3D printer, which is going to actually reproduce this object in the real world. You have a large number of technologies which are available for 3D printing, and we're not going to cover all of them today. I'll just cover maybe a couple. Laser stereolithography is a simple mechanism, and that's the one on the top middle of the slide, where you can see in salmon this liquid, um, which is called a polymer, so think about it as a liquid. And on top in yellow, you can see a laser beam which is projected on the liquid. And that laser beam with the high temperature is actually going to solidify a layer of the polymer through a process called polymerization. When it's done, it's going to move up one level and it's going to you know, layer another one and another one and another one until the 3D model is fully reproduced. Once the polymerization process is finished, we're going to take out the liquid and you'll have your 3D model. You can see on the left is another one, uh, which is uh, SLS. Um, this one is a very simple um, process, but it's probably better for powder type of, of, of ingredient, not necessarily liquids. Which the powder that can be metal, think about it, metal powder, is pushed you know, to the top and you have a little drum. This drum is actually then pushing the powder onto the area that the laser is going to solidify. The heat is actually going to solidify the powder and then once the layer is done, another layer and so on. So that's one mechanism. And let's maybe um, take another one. On the right side, you can see the fuse deposition. Fuse deposition is a hard, um, let's say, metal or plastic line. And you can see in red, this little head is heating the, uh, the compound. And once the compound is melting, it is being deposed on the layer. And then the, let's say, environment, the temperature and the environment is going to solidify this layer and so on until you fin finalize the layering and reproduce any model pretty much you want. We're making a huge amount of progress in 3D printing and their application are broad across multiple sectors and industries. Blockchain, also called DLTs, as in distributed ledger technologies. This is a very interesting concept and I think a lot of people when we talk about you know, blockchain technology are a little confused, but it's quite a simple technology. Um, so let me uh, start with a couple elements to demystify this technology. First, you need to understand the concept of distribution. So you can see on the slide the difference between centralization and distribution. On the left side, a centralized system. Think about a network of computers or a human organization, which is very centralized, with somebody managing everybody at the top of the organization in a centralized way. And all the different nodes or elements are actually going back to the center for decision making. Now, when you move to what we call decentralization, you actually are going to decentralize to different, you know, let's say, sub-layers. So that's why you have here a number of nodes which are controlling smaller portion of the organization. You don't need to go back all the way to the top. 
think from an organization perspective as a business unit, right? Or a region, for example, geographically. And you have a, a subunit which is being managed from a, 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 a sub-level perspective. And then you, you arrive to what we call decentralization. Decentralization is there is no centralized authority. So all the different nodes in a network or in an organization are fully autonomous and they connect with all the different all the nodes across the organization. It's quite an egalitarian way of operating. That's the first thing you need to know. The second is how we operate uh, you know, accounting historically. Historically, humans started a few thousand years ago by performing accounting in what we call a single ledger entry. So think about ledger as a database of information uh, or you know, an accounting system, very simple. We used to say, I'm going to send this money to A, I'm going to receive this money to, from B, and so on. But after thousands of transactions, you didn't know where you had credits or where you had debits. It was very hard to actually reconcile those information. So we created later what we call the double entry ledger or double entry accounting, which was great because then you had a credit and a debit and then you would have a debit and a credit with the person that you've been you know, making those transactions with. Very interesting. The challenge with this is it's a little non-transparent and you need to have the two to reconcile the two accounting and ledger system and, and systems of records to, to be able to ensure that you know, there's not been any mistakes, human mistakes or you know, let's say fraud in the system. Hence, the emergence of what we call triple entry accounting or triple entry ledgers, which will maintain the same system of records of you know, uh, debits and credits, let's say for transactions, debits and credits, but also will have a third entry, which is going to be an immutable entry on an independent system that nobody can cheat, nobody can fraud with. So this is what technically a blockchain is. It's nothing more than a distributed database, um, which is immutable and that you cannot tamper with. The concept of block chain has two elements, the block and the chain. So what we do is we operate on a distributed network where you have all those different nodes, which will have a copy of the, of the, of the different systems and of records, and you'll have what we call a consensus algorithm. This consensus algorithm allows each individuality in the system to agree together on a single data point. And when one data is validated, it is attached in what we call a block. And you can have more than one transaction or activity or data in a single block, let's say three, four, five in a single block. When that block is actually finalized, a miner, uh, whose job it is to actually record those information in the block, will then attach the block to previous blocks that also contain information. Very simple, think about the old time in medieval ages where you had a letter that was stamped by the, you know, with wax by the king or the queens. It is the same system, making them you know, not, not, let's say, temperable, uh, but also you can connect one with a wax to another. That's how it works. Those blocks are connected together, which makes it very difficult to go back, let's say, one year or six months and modify one block, because you will have to modify all the other blocks in the chain that contain this information. It is offering us huge opportunity from a transparency perspective. We can now have micro fund transfer and exchange. We can think for the first time about secured voting system, evolving democracy. We can think about smart contract. That would be codes that would actually code the different contracts that we have. Your, your employment contracts, your relationship contract with a vendor or different third party entities or any type of contract can be automated and then recorded in a transparent way and immutable way in the blockchain. Think about accounting, uh, think also about tokenized ecosystem where all the world we are around is not only physical but virtual and everything including a chair or a car can now become a, a digital asset and that can, can be recorded on a blockchain. And there will be and we'll see some of the application in the healthcare area. Extended realities. So there's a lot of discussion about virtual reality, but we wanted to explore with you the continuum of reality from on the left side, the real environment, all the way to the right side with the virtual environment. So on the left side is just you and I operating, you know, daily life, fully real. And on the right side is a fully virtual environment. Think about a video game, right? You're totally immersed in a video game, totally virtual, 100%. And in the middle, we have what we call the mixed realities. The first one is augmented reality. Augmented reality is the world as you see it, but imagine you would have glasses, and on those glasses you would have data that would be displayed saying, hey, this individual is this, or providing us information on directions, uh, or you know, social you know, information on the environment around us, or weather forecast, for example. Overlay over the real world, that's augmented reality. The reality has been augmented with digital data. And the second area uh, in the mixed reality spectrum, just after, is augmented virtuality. It's the opposite. You're fully immersed in a virtual environment, but that's your real self, your real hands, your real body. You're walking as a real physical individual in a virtual environment. That's what is called augmented virtuality. 
we have augmented virtual reality with the real world. So as you can see, there's a number of potential applications across multiple sectors, and that's another great general purpose technology that we're planning to use. Drones. Probably a lot of us are thinking about drones as either you know, war uh, engines or probably little games for our kids. But drone is a fabulous invention, which is actually generating a huge amount of potential across multiple sectors. You can see four different types of drone display on, on, on the screen. Um, we, we're just going to talk about maybe on the one on the top right, which is called the multi-rotor drone. Uh, but you can think also about fixed wings and single rotor or the hybrid type of drones. There are multiple applications. Each of those drone profile is actually delivering a type of solution. So for example, the, uh, the fixed wing is more for heavy payload. It's usually, usually utilizing fuel engines, can go long range distances, can actually deliver a large payload to remote areas can also be used as, as a weapon. Um, and you can see on, on the right side with the multi-rotor drones, they are more usually um, smaller, very light, uh, shorter range, electric, and they're probably more used for video, photography, um, telemedicine, and other type of um, the, the delivery of small type of parcels. A multi-rotor drone is very easy. Think about it as having different propellers, which are propelling the drone. Think of it about having a flight central at the core of the engine, which have gyroscope, which have accelerometer, accelerometer, which has GPS, telling you location, altitude, uh, and then potentially embarked uh, systems like video camera and other systems. Um, so quite simple technology, but you'll see this is another general purpose technology that can be used anywhere, pretty much. Think about transportation, think, think about multiple delivery systems and many other usage of drone technologies. Gene sequencing, gene editing, and enhancements, uh, brain enhancements. So one of the major revolution as a general purpose technology um, since the discovery of the DNA helix is our ability to actually sequence um, uh, genes. And that has actually also followed an exponential curve. It used to take you know, about 10 years to sequence the first human genome. So now we're to talking about probably a week. It soon we'll be talking about probably minutes in terms of sequencing over the coming years, which you know, generate a huge opportunity in our ability to understand the human body uh, its ability, but also disease. Think about this from a healthcare perspective. Um, potentially, humans are going to start using it for many different applications, as including the biopharmaceutical industry. One of the most common applications, and that's the one you see now display on your screen, um, is called the molecular scissor, also known as CRISPR-Cas9, um, which is the ability um, to actually identify a dysfunctioning uh, part in the DNA cut this dysfunctioning part and replace it with a functioning part. That's quite a simple concept, but it's bringing a true revolution in how we operate and potentially how we can uh, you know, cure disease and, and enhance the human body. Talking about enhancements, one of the major enhancements humans have always been looking for is becoming you know, brighter, smarter, etc. So nootropics, which is the ability to use drugs or medicines to enhance your me mental capability, uh, is something that is going to be used more and more. Although it would have some limitation because our biological brain has some mechanical limitations. Therefore, the following waves of enhancement will probably be what we call brain computer interfaces. And that's what a number of companies are already exploring today. You probably heard about Elon Musk um, and Neural Lace. Yeah, they are actually exploring the ability to create an interface that could be attached to the brain um, with a you know, very simple non-abrasive or very little abrasion uh, and the ability to connect the brain to the cloud in order to download and upload large volume of data, technically connecting the human brains to the broader systems that we are around us, to the cloud and to the systems. We'll talk about that, but that bears a large number of ethical implications. Uh, and as a biopharmaceutical industry, as we're trying to find solutions for patients, we'll have to think about those implications as we actually deploy those solutions. Big data and analytics is also uh, you know, one of the major general purpose technology. We talked about all those different general purpose technologies. They all produce and gather a large amount of data. And these data produce this huge trillion zillions of databases. And, and a lot of them are unstructured. Some can be structured, but a lot of them are unstructured. And our human brain doesn't have the capability to analyze all of this. And this is when artificial intelligence and analytic solution kick in. That's what you can see on the right side of the graph. The first layer that you can see is big data, a lot of unstructured data, you know, it's just billions of data points. Analytics will allow us to actually start triaging and organizing those data in a way that makes sense. That's what we call analytics. Once we've analyzed those data and structured them, sliced and diced them in different way, 
we can then start gaining insight into, into things, into the world that is around us and potentially for us into disease and solutions for patients. From that insight and analytics, we can then make decision. So that is the continuum, big data, analytics and decision. So big data is definitely a revolution that allows us to actually measure, analyze and take decision of, on our environment. Last but not least is artificial intelligence. So there is a lot of things you know, when we talk about artificial intelligence. Um, but we would like today to uh, demystify that and help you understand what we mean by artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence are seven categories. Uh, they have been categorized by somebody that we call Norvig, is a director of research at Google, uh, where he's identified the different domains of AI. The first one is knowledge representation. This is how we structure knowledge in a form that computer can reason with. Think about common sense, you know, what is an elephant, what is a door. Um, the second area of arti artificial intelligence is automated reasoning. So now we've actually have, have structured knowledge. This is how we're going to use stored information to answer questions and draw a conclusion, make inferences. Uh, for example, can this elephant go through a door? Now you're starting to connect the differences. Then when we've done that, maybe the elephants are going to evolve as part of the, of the environment. They're going to become smaller. I don't know. Uh, and, but the environment is evolving around us. And maybe one day the elephant can go through a door. Or the doors are, ma are, ma you know, are made bigger. So how do the machine learn from the evolving environment around them? This is what we call machine learning. Machine learning are going to start learning from large amount of data, those big data, and they're going to start actually making conclusion that, hold on, the environment around me is evolving, and they're going to make the necessary adjustments, which is part of the intelligence that human display. And think about a one-year-old kid is adjusting by learning from this influx of data. Machine learning or infant learning, very similar concepts. The fourth area is called NLP. Natural language processing. So this is simply uh, you know, put the communication in natural language that the different computer systems are doing. Think about reading, writing, speaking, listening, translating. Machine translation is part of it. You probably use it every day with Google Translate and other systems. Computer vision is the fifth area. This ability for a computer system or a form of intelligence to actually visualize the environment and perceive objects around them. The sixth area is sensors. We talked about it and alluded through it with the Internet of Things. Sensors are those different captors that allow machines to feel and measure the environments. That could be temperature, it can be hygrometry, it can be speed, many different ways of measuring the environment. And then finally, actuator. When you feel the environment, you may want to act on the environment. That's the ability for, for machines to manipulate objects, also move around like, let's say, a one or two-year-old kid. Here are the seven elements that, that are actually constitutive of AI. Now, if we talk about robotics, robotics is nothing more than a combination of those. Think about actuator to act on the environment, sensor, computer vision, and let's say machine learning. That you know, combined will give you robotics. Or for example, natural language processing, machine learning, and automated reasoning will give you a personal assistant. This virtual assistant helping you every day, talking to you, making orders on your behalf. Those combinations will lead to another type of, of artificial form of intelligence. If you're interested in learning more about those technologies, please check my other video on the topic. Thank you very much.